Hi everyone, my name is Belinda Cromer. I'm a Smith County Master Gardener and I'd like to welcome you to our 2021 Smith County Master Gardener Library Series. This year we're a little late kicking it off due to the COVID-19 restrictions and conditions. And for that reason, this series this year will be uh, three Zoom sessions, one each month on the third Friday of the month through May. The first session today is fairies in the garden, pollinators and herbs. The second session in April is fixing to garden in Texas. And the third se session in May is the whole truth, the woodpeckers of East Texas. We uh, hope that you will be able to join us for all three and thanks very much for joining us today. Hopefully by 2022, we will be able to have our in-person programs at the Tyler Library like we've done in the past years. We wanna thank the Tyler Public Library for sponsoring and supporting our library series programs. While I am mentioning the library, I'd like to bring, uh, to provide you a plug for a special event that's coming up in April in support of Earth Day. On Tuesday, April the 20th, we are partnering with the library to give away 50 kits for planting and caring for plants. The Tyler Library Adult Programs are definitely bragging rights for our city of Tyler. We are blessed to have this beautiful library and the staff that maintains it. So thank you very much, Tyler Public Library. Let me share with you, uh, for, before we start, a little bit about our Master Gardener program here in Smith County. We are part of the Texas AgriLife Extension Service. Our group is specifically trained to provide horticulture information, help and education to the people of Smith County through the Smith County Extension Service Office. Our members go through about 72 hours of all varieties of horticulture related education, including hands on activities, and we spend hours in a year long internship to be prepared to serve this community. The classes are normally held the first three months of the year and the internship follows for the next 12 months. This year, again, because of COVID-19, our classes have been delayed and will start in June and go through August with the internship to follow that. The detail for the classes are announced in the Tyler paper and through social media in advance of the class. And we also have information about them at the AgriLife Extension Office, which is located in the Cotton Belt lower level. So if you have any interest in our class, classes, we, and we hope you do, we would love for you to join us. It is a very rewarding organization filled with people who love horticulture, nature, and just digging in the dirt. For anyone interested in seeing uh, our local work and how um, the contributions we make to the community, a good visual for you is in the Tyler Botanical Gardens at the end of the Tyler Rose Garden. We maintain those gardens for the city of Tyler. And just so you know, all of us are just volunteers and we love our work. Now I'd like to introduce to you our speaker for today, and that is Elizabeth Waldrop. You are in for a great treat. I met Elizabeth when I started my Master Gardener internship program. She was my mentor in the idea garden of the Tyler Botanical Garden. This lady loves plants, birds, insects, and anything that involves the outdoors and nature. Her background is broad and her experience is vast. She is a local East Texas girl and she personally has experimented in her own gardens from vegetables and herbs to wildflower meadows. She also raises poultry and is a beekeeper. She writes, paints, does needlework type projects and other arts and crafts. This lady, I think you could safely say has many talents. I am blessed to call her my friend and I'm very blessed to learn from her. Before we get started, a little housekeeping. If you have any questions during the program, please use the chat in the Zoom room to uh, type your questions and we will do our very best to answer those at the end of the program. We also ask that you stay muted during the program and follow the Zoom. Zoom courtesy rules for everyone's enjoyment and listening pleasure. And now 
Elizabeth, thank you for sharing with us today, and Zoom is all yours. Okay. I want to welcome everybody back to the Master Gardeners in the Library series, and I want to especially thank the Tyler Public Library for their support in helping us educate East Texans about sustainable garden practices. I'm really excited to be with you guys here today and to talk about my favorite plants, which are herbs, and our fairy pollinators. The first half of this talk is really a tale of pretty bugs and why we need them. In the United States, one third of all agricultural output depends on pollinators. Insects and other pollinators are vital to the production of healthy crops for food, fibers, edible oils, medicines, and other products. Pollinators are also essential components of the habitats and ecosystems that many wild animals rely on for food and shelter. There is evidence that populations of native and managed pollinators are in decline. We've all heard about the loss of bees in the United States. The loss of benefits derived from being from them is being felt in the agricultural community. Human activities such as urbanization can lead to habitat fragmentation or destruction. Changes in agricultural practices and the use of broad spectrum pesticides can disrupt or destroy long established pollinator habitats. Other factors leading to pollinator declines include disease and the spread of invasive plant species. So whether you're a farmer or a homeowner, there are many ways you could learn about pollinators to help them prosper by enhancing our native pollinator habitats and protecting against pollinator declines. This is what our traditional suburban lawn looks like. It is beautiful. It's, it's very calming and green and it includes not very many plants. It's a monoculture. There's a lot of grass, there may be a few trees, there may be a few flowers here and there, usually not the kinds that produce pollen, and then a few shrubs. But other than that, there's not a lot going on. The other picture shows a native short grass prairie. That is a healthy, natural, sustainable ecosystem. This is what it looks like, and this ecosystem will support a variety of insects, small mammals, and reptiles. It is not dependent on anybody to water it, or put chemicals on it, or mow it. It just does its thing. The reason we have lawns in the United States is an interesting story. And because I am actually a history major, it um, fascinated me when I did the research on it. The concept of a lawn in North America started early because settlers who came to this country realized that their grazing animals that they brought with them were starving. The native grasses of the Northeastern United States were not as widespread or nutritious as the ones that they were used to in Europe. The colonists began to request supplies of grasses. By 1672, they had introduced 22 plant species that were not native to America. Most of them were grasses and clovers for feeding, feeding cows, sheep, and horses. They also brought in with that fodder all the weeds that are the ruin of the perfect lawn like dandelion and plantain. These imports formed the first village commons, which were common areas for grazing pastures. Most colonists only had one or two cows or a few goats. So a lot of entire villages could graze all of those animals together in one big common space. And they planted those with healthy grasses for the livestock. However, it wasn't until the French king, Louis XVII, formed garden styles to include parterres and lawns that they called tapis vert, which means green carpets. He started these developments around 1660, and it was the very first time anyone had ever used grass as a garden element. Grass was not considered to be something that was elevated enough for gardens before he, he did that. The English nobility, nobility took up the style soon after, but they expanded the idea. Instead of just having these little green carpets, suddenly they wanted to have these vast, unfenced, close crop pastures to allow them to see unobstructed views from their homes. 
And the grass meadows were really labor intensive. They required a lot of people to maintain them and keep them low and even. So they became not only a sign of status and wealth, but a way to show off your status and wealth. Not only could people better see your beautiful home, but you could prove that you had a lot of people taking care of your grass. The style became popular with the elites of the colonies as a symbol of prestige, but they were still not widely copied. Most people in America were too busy growing gardens trying to you know, keep themselves alive, so they weren't going to plant you know, acres of grass for no reason. Frederick Law Olmsted was an American landscape architect who began designing urban parks in swaths with, that had swaths of lawn in them, and these included Prospect and Central Park. This is a picture of Prospect Park. That he started that developing developing that style in the mid 1800s, and this set off a fashion for such spaces in both parks and residential landscapes across America. However, they were still mainly reserved for well-funded spaces, either those of the wealthy or public areas that were supported by public funds. In the mid 20th century, streets of tract housing became the norm. Soldiers were coming back from World War II. They needed a place to live. They had some extra money. The economy was doing well. So Levittown in Pennsylvania became the first area of suburbia that had homes in rows. Street after street, basically the same house plan, one after another, and they were on small lots. People in America were used to having more space, so they didn't allow you to build fences between the houses. The close crop front yard of grass became an emblem of prosperity and of being a good conscientious neighbor because you wanted to be able to see grass as far as you could see. And you wanted your grass to look just like your neighbor's grass and their neighbor's grass to look just like their grass. And so being able to keep this uniform, lush, green lawn became a symbol of the American dream of home ownership as much as the home itself. You could prove what a good, upstanding citizen you were by how nice your lawn looked. However, as we come to a deeper understanding of how we use our land, and how that affects not only our daily lives, but our environment and our climate, we've begun to rethink the lawn. Not only is a non-native monoculture in the form of an endless sea of short grass that stretches over our neighborhoods, labor intensive and expensive to maintain, it also requires a lot of chemicals. It's not healthy or sustainable for the environment at large. Currently, the largest irrigated crop in the United States is turf grass, and that grass consumes 50% of all residential water. Reducing or eliminating lawns has become not only a fashion, but a way to reconnect with nature. These are some pictures of some front lawns that can show you can plant a diverse landscape that is really beautiful and also healthy and sustainable. There are so many ways to rethink a lawn in forms of texture. You can put in things that have this, these wonderful colors, these wonderful smells, that have all of this habitat space for insects and birds and still be a good neighbor. You can create mini meadows, you can have European style mixed borders, you can create, create the fire break or xeriscape gardens that are common in the West, and you can even plant beautiful food and herb gardens, which is my favorite. In France, they call a herb or food garden a potager, and these are examples of from high to low, what you can do with a potager style. The first one is an example of the Sun King Louis XVII style gardens with parterres that is in Villandry, France. The second one is a British garden where their south facing garden was actually at the front of the house and they couldn't grow any vegetables in the back because it was too dark. So they just turned their front yard into a vegetable garden but it's beautiful. They took time to design it and really emphasize structure and color and texture. And it's a lovely, lovely garden. And the next one is just a modest little uh, bungalow in California that also has a very well thought out, beautiful textured garden in the front yard. This is a house in Tyler. And I love it because it's, cute, it's funky, it's informal, and it 
is a really lovely, fun space. Pottinger Gardens are full of plant and insect diversity. A well-planned and planted garden can increase the diversity in a suburban or urban setting by hundreds of percent, and they are beautiful. Creating a garden that attracts and feeds pollinators, birds, and small wildlife does not have to look like a snaky mess, as my mother says. You can have both happy neighbors and a healthy, diverse garden. So if you go beyond just planting a butterfly bush here or there to bring winged pollinators into your garden, you can actually do that with herbs and it's easy and delicious. And you can, you can put them in your flower beds, you can put them in your vegetable garden, you can put them anywhere. A lot of herbs are well behaved, small, and no matter how, what their size, the bugs are going to find them and love them. Herb gardens attract beneficial bugs and other pollinators to your garden by growing useful plants. It's a simple strategy that enlivens your garden and can charm your taste buds and improve your environment. By integrating the culinary and useful plants into your plantings, you invite real life winged magic into your garden. You invite our um, fairy pollinators. These are the two ingredients of our fairy garden. The column, common pollinators of East Texas are butterflies and moths, honeybees, bumblebees, and solitary bees, such as mason bees. Wasps and flies, which are pollinators and, and should be encouraged, though we aren't always happy to have them around. Lace wings, and then some um, non-insect, um, pollinators or hummingbirds and bats, which are also important here in East Texas. Plants that are considered herbs are pretty diverse. A rose is considered not only a garden plant, but also um, an herb because an herb is defined as a plant that can be used to flavor cooking, a plant that has the medicinal property, or a plant that is used to create fragrant compounds. Plants that you should consider, and it, depending on what kind of pollinators you'd like to attract. Rosemary, thyme, and borage are beloved of hum, honeybees. Rue, fennel, dill, and citrus for swallowtail butterflies. Monarda and lemon balm for bumblebees. All flowering sages, but especially pineapple sage for hummingbirds. Oregano for lace wings basil, mint, and parsley for bees, wasps, and butterfly larvae, jasmine, nicotiana, valerian, and single pinks for moths, and then calendula, poppy, and nasturtium for mason bees. To prove that I actually do practice what I preach, these are, the next three slides are pictures of my gardens at home, and I wanted to Prove with the diversity of these gardens that an herb garden can look like any garden. It doesn't, they don't have a specific way they have to be done. This is the formal Mediterranean style raised garden that's near my kitchen door and it is full of culinary herbs year round. I've got the four corners planted with some kind of big evergreens that look decent all year long so when the rest of it goes to pieces in the heat of the summer or the dead of winter, at least I've got something in there. And um, these are long lived, they have permanent positions and they give this garden structure. And then I can fit other things in there as my interests change or uh, I decide that I wanna try and diet or whatever I wanna do in there. I can, I can move plants into this garden, but it, it looks neat and orderly most of the time. Then this is just a flower bed in my backyard that's off my back patio. And this one is a mixed flower bed it, that's just kind of planted in the uh, eccentric English tradition. And it's got sages in it, it's got germanders, artemisias, licorice plants, and a variety of grasses and flowers that are beneath a little gem magnolia. But it gives, it, it gives a certain lushness to it. And just walking by and running your hand along the tops of the flowers, the scents are just amazing. 
This is a little uh, shrub border in my backyard. Again, you know, this is normal plants that you see in any backyard in East Texas. There's boxwoods and crepe myrtles, but there's herbs tucked into this. There's cardoon and hyssop and castor bean that are giving variety of textures. They give off a lovely smell and there's constant activity of butterflies and bees and wasps moving in and out of this garden. So it's very entertaining to my cats. The, these are the mature pollinators that we're trying to invite into our garden with planting herbs. And I tend to call them the Disney princesses because one day I was with my sister and we drove into my garage and at the end of my garage is a bird bath. And around that bird bath at the time I had planted some zinnias and some basil. And so it was just completely full of little birds. And um, as we drove in, the birds flew up off the bird bath because we startled them. And a bunch of butterflies and bees flew off the flowers because they were disturbed by the birds. And my sister was like, oh my gosh, this is like the scene from Cinderella where they're dressing her. <laughs> and I started laughing and thought that was hysterical. But when I thought about it later, I see that scene every time I drive into the garage, but my sister hadn't seen it before and her being so impressed by it was um, reminded me how lucky I am to live in a place where I can have scenes like that in my everyday life. So mature pollinators drink nectar or collect pollen. They add their own considerable beauty to the garden and they won't cause any flower damage while they increase plant reproduction and health. This is one of my very favorite sayings about bees. Bees are my favorite six-legged critter. And um, I tend to look up a lot of quotes about bees periodically, but this is my favorite. Bees work for man and yet they never bruise the master's flower, but leave it having done as fair as ever and as fit to use. So both the flower doth stay and the honey doth run. And that's not just true of bees all mature pollinators are doing this. They, they aren't eating the plants. They're just visiting the plants to take a little drink or collect a little pollen and then they go off. These next slides are going to demonstrate kind of what specific plants will, take, will attract certain pollinators and why. And that way, as, you're look, as you find new plants that you wanna to add to your garden, you can, just from looking at the plant, you can kind of tell whether or not it's going to attract a certain kind of pollinator to it. This is a hummingbird with uh, pineapple sage and any long tubular nectar producing flower that is red, orange, or pink is going to attract a hummingbird. They need the long shape of the flower because their beak and tongue is so long. Very few other pollinators can utilize this type of flower structure. So these flowers actually depend on hummingbirds to pollinate them. The next one is a hair streak on basil. Um, butterflies will also need a tubular flower or one that is flat based that they can land on. Um, and they like a tube that is short and wide. Butterflies are not particular about flower scents. They enjoy a wider variety of flower color than most other insects, but are attracted mostly to light, bright colors. This is a honeybee. Bees like flowers that are clustered together. They want to be able to collect pollen from a lot of flowers without having to fly a lot. So you, when, when you're talking about a clustered flower like a basil or a thyme or something like that, there's a lot of flowers they can cover in a short amount of time and they don't have to expend a lot of flying energy to do that. They are drawn to very light, bright colors such as white, yellow, pink, and light blues. They are not attracted to red flowers. They see them as black. If the flower has a strong scent that's red, they might go to it because they have really uh, sensitive scent glands in their antennae, but they aren't going to spot them in the landscape. This is a sphinx moth and moths prefer strong scented, not blooming flowers that are light colored. The scent makes these 
flower is easy for the moths to locate and the pale colors are going to reflect any available light which will attract moths to it. This is a picture of um, a moon garden that is actually planted to encourage moths. Moon gardens are some of my very favorite. When I was working, I had really long hours and so I was getting home late and it was usually after dark. And the only time I could really enjoy my garden and just sit in it when I wasn't outside working on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon was at night. And so I learned that I really enjoyed white flowers and I planted all of these white flowers and then suddenly I realized they smelled better than other flowers. So I started planting a lot of really great smelling white flowers and I attracted more and more moths into my garden and hummingbirds. Hummingbirds will fly into a garden like this until it is pitch dark. The kind of plants that work well in a moon garden are jasmine, stock, nicotiana, moonflowers, honeysuckle, datura, valerian, and milk thistle. Many of these plants are used in perfumes, so they actually are herbs, while datura, valerian, and milk thistle are used in traditional medicines. If you plant these near walkways and porches or windows and doors that open onto rooms where you spend time in the evening, you can enjoy the scents of the flowers and the view of the flowers and the moths that come to them. When you are planting one of these gardens, avoid bright outdoor lights because bright outdoor lights are going to confuse the moths and attract the moths just to the lights and they won't be able to feed or pollinate because they will be so concentrated on the light, they won't eat. They'll they will actually forget to eat. It's just too much sensory uh, stimuli for them. This is a green lacewing. A lacewing is kind of a under talked about pollinator in East Texas, but they sip nectar from a variety of plants. They especially love oregano and they use it as a host plant for their eggs. The bottom picture is the somewhat scary looking larvae of the lacewing that is eating aphids. Many immature predatory insects have an ugly duckling stage and we need to learn to identify those not only for our own sakes because we want the lacewings to grow up into lacewings and pollinate our garden, but we want the babies to live and eat as many aphids as they possibly can. That brings us to um, our wicked witches, not really. There are many bugs and arthropods that are frequent in a biodiverse garden. And I've read this, um, I've read this statistic in many ways. A lot of people say only 1% out of 100 of garden bugs do damage to your plants. Some say it's about 3%, others say it's about 10%. Considering that I did this slide right after I had uh, stepped into a fire ant mound, I decided it was going to be 10% because it seemed like there were a million fire ants. <laughs> so I took, the, I took the low number, but still, oh, if only 10% of the bugs that you see in your garden are damaging your plants, that's a really low amount. The other 90% are either causing no permanent damage to your plants or are actually beneficial and are either pollinating or they're eating damaging bugs. So live and let live, my pretties. When I was a little girl, my great granny used to say this every time she planted something. One for the wiggle worm and she'd put in a seed. And then she'd say one for the crow, another seed, one for the fairies and one to grow. So in every hole that she was planting seeds, she was dropping down four. Many years after I first learned this, I learned it wasn't just her saying, but a traditional English seed planting rhyme that reminded the gardener and the farmer to plant extra seeds to benefit the entire ecosystem. Plant extra, everybody is going to enjoy the bounty. And when we talk about our next guys, you're gonna understand why you need a few extras. These are, um, these are the little worms that actually become fairies. And they uh, are cute to some people, but most people find them a little spooky. These are the larval hosts. Um, these are the larval pollinators, better known um, as the plants that 
as the creatures that turn our plants into sacrificial offerings. They need host plants in your garden. If they don't have those plants to eat, they're never going to grow up. So host plants are not going to be the stars of your garden as far as looks, but they do perform a hugely important function in the life of a pollinator. So resign yourself to the carnage and plant them in the back. This picture is a picture of some rue in my garden that gets eaten down to just green twigs every year. There are four caterpillars in the left hand photo. All of these munching worms will turn into swallowtail butterflies. Some of the largest, most beautiful butterflies we have in East Texas. That's the picture of one down at the bottom. It takes a lot of food to turn a worm into a fairy, but the plant is going to survive this because it's adapted to feed these pollinators and suffer no long-term damage. Within a month of the caterpillars maturing, this plant will have already begun to replace its lost growth. Even though most of us are not going to have the space or the inclination to recreate a natural prairie, we can contribute to biodiversity and the health of our environment and create some pretty tasty meals and Disney princess moments by developing a little space to herbs and our fellow and being thoughtful of our fairy pollinators. Emily Dickinson said to make a prairie all it takes is a clover and one bee, a clover and a bee and reverie. I want to thank you all for your time and attention and remind you that you can follow us on Facebook at Smith County Master Gardeners. You can see us on YouTube by searching Smith County Master Gardeners. You can visit our website at txmg.org backslash Smith. And you can email your garden questions to smithmghelpdesk at gmail.com. And if anyone has a question about their own personal garden that they think might be too long to go into the chat, you can actually email that to the help desk and ask them to refer it to me and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much and I think we can go to chat now. Good plants to grow in the light shade would be your mints and your balms. So, um, Spearmint, peppermint, they even have wonderful orange mints and chocolate mints, and all of them bloom and all of them will attract butterflies and bees. And um, then you also have your balms, like your lemon balm and um, your bee balm, which is also called Mamarda. And those things will grow in light shade. And a lot of kind of plants that like a little bit cooler weather, such as cilantros. Um, parsley's, things like that, as long as they get um, some really, they get bright light shade, they will do okay in light shade. Um, they, are, they aren't particular, but there, there are lots of herbs that you can, you can have a fairly shady garden and still grow. Okay. Pollinate is faring right now after the winter storm. <laughs> the pollinators and the birds both really took a hit. Um, I lost an entire beehive um, during the this last storm, and it was heartbreaking. And I know that um, talking to some other beekeepers that that smaller hives were lost because they just you know we we aren't used to this kind of weather, but. If there's plenty of food around for them in the spring, they will start reproducing and they will they will do okay. I uh, was happy to see my first bumblebees coming out of the ground um, at my house a few days ago, and uh, they were out looking uh, diligently for um, pollen to take home to create more baby bumblebees. So we encourage them to do that. Uh, is it the if one I want the butterflies? butterflies in my garden what should I plant okay if you want butterflies in your garden um, you can plant lots of different things the th 
thing about having butterflies in your garden is you're probably going to attract other things too. I know that butterflies are the, the most fun, but you'll probably get a lot of, of different things. Um, it depends on what you want. So if you want the little white butterflies, they like, uh, they like stuff that grows in a vegetable garden, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. Um, your little sulfurs, the bright yellow butterflies, love clovers and vetch, which you know, grow in bar ditches. They're, they're easy to grow. Hair streaks love hawthorns, blueberries, and your prunus species like uh, cherries and peaches and plums. Uh, skippers like lima beans, and they also feed on a lot of our native grasses. So if you've got a little mini meadow close to your house, you'll probably see a lot of skippers. Brushfoot bees like sunflowers, and fritillaries like uh, passion vine and uh, violets. And if you want luna moths, the you have to plant trees. So they they uh, lay their eggs in hickory, black cherry, sweet gum, willow, and red maple, and their their babies grow up there. But a luna moth doesn't feed as an adult. So once it turns into a luna moth, it has a few days to mate and lay eggs, and then it it doesn't survive any longer than that because uh, they don't eat as a grown up. And then for other moths, butterfly bushes, moonflowers, cleome, petunia, impatience, nicotiana, primrose, some a lot of big wide flowers that have deep centers that hold a lot of of uh, pollen and nectar, and then, you know, your really wonderful smelling things, like honeysuckle, datura, stock, valerian, milk thistle, and jasmine will be good for those. Okay, I don't see any more questions in the chat room, but again, if you have a question and you want to direct it to Elizabeth, please send it to the uh, help desk and she will address those. And thank you all for joining today. Hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And we hope to see you on April the 16th when we talk about fixing the garden in Texas. That's going to be another wonderful uh, program in the series. And thanks again to the Tyler Public Library and you all have a very blessed day.